welcome to the 700 Club. Harsh retaliation, punishment, revenge. That's what Iran is threatening against Israel after an attack on its consulate in Syria. The strike killed two Iranian generals responsible for aiding terror groups in their war against the Jewish state. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl reports. The attack on the consulate building in the Syrian capital is considered an attack on sovereign Iranian territory. Israel has not claimed responsibility for the blast that killed General Mohammad Reza Zahidi, along with his deputy and five other Iranian officers. General Zahidi was a commander in the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Quds Force and a key figure in Iran's proxy war against Israel that provides training and weapons for terror groups in the region. Zahedi and his deputy reportedly meeting with those leaders inside the consulate, likely planning further strikes on Israel. Iran is threatening a harsh retaliation, and Hezbollah said the enemy would receive punishment and revenge. CBN News war correspondent Chuck Holton says Iran doesn't want a one-on-one -on -one war with Israel. They want to continue with this proxy war through fighting Israel through the Houthis, through Hezbollah, and through Hamas. That includes sending weapons to terrorists inside biblical Judea and Samaria, also known as the West Bank. Israeli forces operating in the territories discovering weapons shipped by Iran. Massive amounts of explosives. They're starting to find mines, landmines, hand grenades, rockets. Uh, light anti-tank weapons, all sorts of uh, weapons like that, and that bodes very poorly for Israel. If a force the size of the one from Gaza that struck Israel on October 7th came out of Judea and Samaria instead, the destruction and death toll could be much worse. Because it basically surrounds Jerusalem on three sides. If 1,500 bad guys had come uh, across into Jerusalem and started going crazy, they could have easily killed a lot more people. They could absolutely wreak havoc in Jerusalem, the capital city. In Gaza, seven aid workers with the World Central Kitchen died in what Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu called an unintended strike. He said officials are investigating and will do everything for this not to happen again. The IDF said it is making great efforts to enable a safe passage of humanitarian aid and is working in full cooperation and coordination with the WCK organization to support their efforts to provide food and humanitarian aid to the residents of the Gaza Strip. Meanwhile, U.S. State Department and Israeli officials met for two hours in a video conference call to discuss Israel's impending invasion of Rafah, Hamas's last major stronghold in Gaza. The White House said the two sides agree on the need to destroy Hamas in Rafah, but expressed concerns over the risk to innocent Gazans. The Israelis agreed to consider those concerns and hold follow-up discussions. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, there needs to be a safe area created, and the IDF is in position to create that safe area so civilians from Rafa can go to a safe area that they would then be under the protection of the IDF, wouldn't be a, uh, under threat from the IDF, and then you could uh, continue the war against Hamas and continue to wipe it out. My heart goes out to the workers who were lost from the World Central Kitchen. Uh, they were responsible for over 60% of the NGO aid going into Gaza. The fact that they have suspended operations as a result of this strike, and it was a strike from Israel. It was quite targeted. When you see the picture of the uh, van that they were traveling in, it's quite clear that it was a targeted munition. And it, I don't understand how it ever happened because they claim they were coordinating their trip with the IDF and the IDF knew and knew that they were coming from a warehouse filled with food and they were trying to feed civilians inside Gaza to prevent starvation. Uh, this is something that Israel has to get to the bottom of and, and they've promised full transparency. Uh, I, I hope and I pray that we can w wrap up this war against Hamas as quickly as possible. Uh, these kinds of um, casualties of war are, uh, it's just horrific. It should not have happened. 
and and I I trust the IDF to be transparent. I hope they live up to that trust. Well, the threat from Iran goes far beyond its support of terrorism. The world is focused on the war against Hamas in Gaza, and Tehran is using the distraction as a cover to develop its nuclear weapons program. CBM Middle East Bureau Chief Chris Mitchell has that story. As Israel fights Hamas in the south and prepares for a potentially greater conflict with Hezbollah in the north, Iran remains a major player behind the chaos. That could be due to the regime trying to distract the world from what's happening with the country's nuclear program. Whether it is a formal strategy or it's just happening that way, it's absolutely a danger. Iran threw out the nuclear inspectors, eight most important ones, in September 2023. They tripled the speed of enriching uranium for most of the last few months, between 60 percent and 20 percent enriched uranium. Experts believe the regime has enough uranium to make up to eight nuclear weapons. They could enrich to 90 percent weaponized uranium in like a week or two. Israel, the United States, the world is very distracted by Hamas, Hezbollah and the rest of the world by Ukraine. So could Iran try to break out now? Yeah. Iran claims it successfully launched three satellites earlier this year. Bob sees this as especially significant in terms of weapons delivery systems. The technology they use for launching satellites can also be used potentially for nuclear weapons, in particular um, ICBMs, which can go a lot further. As far as we know, they're not there yet, but we have to keep a very strong eye on that, too. Rafael Grossi, chief of the International Atomic Energy Agency, recently reported that Iran continues to prevent access to inspectors and video recorded by cameras at key nuclear sites. We must move forward in the clarification of the many aspects that require this from Iran. All countries that have signed the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty are not supposed to have nuclear weapons in any form. This is forbidden in international law. Bob says Iran is effectively blinding the world to the country's nuclear progress. It's a very dangerous situation, and it's problematic. The, the, the IAEA Board of Governors, you know, has basically decided to do nothing about it, certainly not referring it to the U.N. Security Council. Bob maintains sanctions from the original 2015 nuclear deal could be reintroduced through a snapback arrangement but this provision has a time limit. If the United States and the three key European countries want to snap back, they can snap it back and the entire UN Security Council would need to enforce it. When you get to October 2025, January 2026, so many of the limits on Iran fall apart that Israel and I hope the United States will need to make a decision to do something potentially militarily with Iran if it does not radically reduce where its nuclear program is today. Retired General Amir Avivi, head of the Israel Defense Security Forum, sees Iran's nuclear threat in a global context. If Israel has to go to uh, all full-scale war with uh, Lebanon, this is our chance also to hit Iran and all the nuclear sites. So really, if the U.S. wants to avoid a regional and maybe global war, it needs to show leadership and uh, really, really deter Iran and Hezbollah this is the only way to stabilize the Middle East. Avivi also uses more of a moral perspective to describe Israel's war with Iran's proxies. It's a war between darkness and light, between evil and good. We're fighting the whole Western society's war against extremism, against people who really want to destroy our way of living. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. It's like there's this elaborate plan to keep us all distracted from the main thing. And the main thing is if Iran gets nuclear weapons, that completely changes the balance of power in the Middle East. It is an end game for Israel because now Tel Aviv will be under threat of nuclear attack. And would they actually launch that? I think the answer, based on their rhetoric over the past 40 years, is yes, they would. Uh, they consider Israel to be the little Satan, and guess who's the great Satan? Well, you and I. And if that satellite launching technology turns into ICBMs, what's the next target for them? So why are we negotiating? Why is this 
allowed to happen? Why did the administration send them $10 billion? What kind of message was that? They're sponsoring Houthis. They're sponsoring Hezbollah. They're sponsoring Hamas. And it seems to be all some kind of grand game to keep the world distracted. It has upended the Abraham Accords. I mean, it's, it's definitely put them on pause. Uh, and, and was Israel close to having peace with all of its neighbors? Well, for the Iranians, that was unacceptable. And so how do, how do they proxy war to a distraction point and, and sort of hide what they're really trying to do? Again, a nuclear-armed Iran is unacceptable because it puts everything, the entire world, at risk. And please let us wake up to it. To add to the distraction, we're in election year. We seem to be incredibly divided. The Democrats and the Republicans can't even talk to each other. They can't even come to any kind of compromise on legislation. So how can we come to compromise and say, well, it's in our national interest to stop this? Can we have a unified voice speaking to the world that people will actually believe? Are, are we so distracted with our internal problems that we can't pay attention to the world stage. For Christians, now more than ever, let us pray and let's believe that there is this righteous judge because he is a righteous judge and can he intervene on our behalf. Well, itchy eyes, runny noses, and constant sneezing. One in four Americans suffers from seasonal allergies. Medical reporter Lori Johnson tells us what to do to ease the misery. This time of year, pollen often becomes public enemy number one, and it's floating all around, mainly from trees, grass, and weeds. Our level of discomfort often depends on where we live. Here in Virginia Beach, we really have a tough time because this is the second worst city in America for seasonal allergies, right behind Wichita, Kansas. Rounding out the top five, Greenville, South Carolina, Dallas, and Oklahoma City. The good news is you can find ways to minimize symptoms. We all like that fresh spring air to come in, but what's in that air? Pollen. So keep that out. That means staying inside, closing windows, and turning on the air conditioner. When you do go out, remember that pollen is a magnet and will stick to your clothes, hair, and skin. When you go back in the house, you can avoid spreading it by changing clothes and taking a shower. I always tell my patients to keep an allergy-free zone in their house, and that should be the bedroom, because that's where you spend the most time and that's where you sleep. Frequently wash your sheets in hot water, and pets can bring in pollen from the outside as well. You want to take the, uh, your pets, your loving animals, out of your bed, because that also will, uh, is a slew of allergenic um, antigens that will cause allergic reactions and respiratory issues. An air purifier can also help. Use a HEPA filter with a carbon filtration system. That combination is the best to clean the air inside. When it comes to treatment, experts say allergy shots tend to work best. And it increases the immune system's tolerance. So over time, we can significantly decrease or even eliminate your symptoms altogether. I got to say, Gordon, the allergy shots are fantastic. What you do is you get uh, your shot or shots. About You start up with like one, two, or three a week, mm -hmm. and then you gradually taper off to like a series of shots maybe once every two months. I had them. I went through, I did. And you know, it's, it takes a couple years. You have to go, you know, frequently for like a couple years. And I stopped taking my allergy shots four years ago and I haven't had any allergy symptoms since mm -hmm. then. It's been great because I had suffered horribly with allergies and tried everything and the shots were the only thing that worked. Did you uh, get a panel to find out what you were I allergic did. to? I know, that was not the most fun I've ever had, but it's really interesting to learn all the things you're allergic to. So what they do is the allergist kind of puts every conceivable thing that you could be allergic to underneath your skin and if your skin sort of welts up then they 
know that's what you're allergic to. And it turns out I was allergic to so many things. And it's great, even if you don't have the allergy shots, it's really great to know what you're allergic to because you can at least keep an eye on the weather forecast and the local news and they'll tell you which particular allergens are high, you know, what types of trees, what types of grass, what types of pollen, because they can be high in spring, summer, or fall. So you can kind of, you know, even if you don't do the shots, you can. it's good to know what you're allergic to. Right, so you can, you can get rid of it in your garden. Exactly. <laughs> so don't get those trees. Don't plant those ash trees. That's one of my big allergens, yeah. All right, is there, short of shots and the panel and doing all of that, is there anything over the counter? I, I know people that, that swear by Zyrtec. And, right, um, exactly. And so you may have noticed in the, in the show, or in the uh, story that I just said, Virginia Beach is the second worst two. city in the country. So I went to the store to get some of these things to show our viewers, mm -hmm. and the shelves were practically bare. <laughs> that goes to show you how this bad allergy allergies season. are. You know, none of the other shelves were bare, like during COVID, just the mm -hmm. allergy section. But, yeah, I, I had a meeting yesterday with an allergy sufferer, and <laughs> she was having trouble staying in the meeting because she was it was it was off the charts for her. Well, you need to tell her to get the shots because I used to be that person. But anyway, most folks start out with an antihistamine. So this is an antihistamine, a Claritin, Zyrtec, Zizol, and these are great for instant relief. Sometimes people complain about being drowsy. Some people have the opposite effect. They're, they make you hyper. But a lot of folks uh, like these. I actually had a side effect, which was a little strange. I lost my sense of taste and smell. Can you believe it? It's it's an, an, a rare side effect. So then that this, wasn't from COVID. That was uh, this was before COVID. Yeah, oh. mm -hmm. yeah. So then uh, this is another great thing. These are called corticosteroids. Some people just call them steroids. I'm talking about Flonase. Uh, Nasonex, and I used to so take... So these are inhalers. Right, these, and these do not work instantly. You have to kind of build up, so it takes a couple... Well, I've heard none of it works instantly. Uh, well... You can take an antihistamine and get, right, you, you know, six-hour, 12-hour right. relief. But right. these longer terms, yep. like the shots, Oh yeah, it, the it is a longer yeah. term solution. Um, so if you, I loved Flonase, and I used to take Flonase every day for years, and then I started thinking, gee, I don't know if I really want to take a steroid the rest of my life indefinitely. Aren't there side effects to the long term well, use? They, sort I've of. I actually damage yeah, things. Yeah, nasal dryness, and I went to my ENT and I said, is there any problem with me taking Flonase every day indefinitely? And he said, not really. Don't worry about it. <laughs> but anyway, uh, hmm. I I was said, well, I. I really don't want to do that and he said well then take the shots but these these are good it takes at least a couple days sometimes a couple weeks to sort of build up the reason you know build up your to the way where they fully work when you're suffering and you hear it's going to take a couple of weeks you kind of go no right exactly right yeah right. so what, what provides the most immediate relief um, well, these uh, antihistamines provide the most immediate relief. So, but plan ahead. If you know you have allergies, well, I see you plan got nasal ahead. With this. Irrigation now, these there. are wonderful too, and I love these. Although they don't necessarily you love work. Them? If you have, what I love them, they're so much fun. Have you ever tried a neti pot? There is no fun to that. <laughs> well, it depends on what you consider fun. I, I, I do not it. consider things coming out of my like, nose um, and mouth fun. But what it is is your. Um, this is called nasal irrigation. There are two. Forms. Of I know, right? Fun I know. So this is, I, but I, I, it's fun because you're like rinsing out your sinus, you're cleaning. You Don't know, it's that ears wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. So what you do is uh, you put a little bit of salt water, and this is a neti well, my pot. My mileage has varied. <laughs> I'm, I'm not getting the same. <laughs> So this is a neti pot, and you basically put salt water in here, and it, you pour it in to one nose, and it goes through your sinuses and comes out the other side. Do this over I the sink. I thought it came out your mouth. No, it can't, no, you have to close your mouth. Oh, okay. um, and then uh, this... It doesn't go back, back your throat? Right? No, no, no. Oh. And this is another type of nasal irrigation where it has a little bit more force. So you put the salt water in here and stick it in here and squeeze it, and it goes through one um, sinus and through the other one, and so out comes all the... Uh, the pollen and also the mucus which clogs your sinuses and you have fun with that it's fun for me oh my. <laughs> see i don't go to clubs <laughs> or parties i stay home and do the nasal irrigation the thing that you need to remember about nasal fun irrigation with Lori. <laughs>
do, let's do a neti pot. Party do, a you have to use distilled Nasal water. You have to use distilled water for this uh, or boil water for a minute because there's this very yeah. rare but deadly amoeba that if it gets into your sinuses can travel to your brain and is almost and always comes fatal. From tap water. It, ca it can, but also more concerning, and this is another subject, I've actually done a story on this, um, for, for people when you're swimming in freshwater ponds or rivers or lakes that's, that's warm. So you want to not get it in your sinuses. So I'm talking about things, you know, when you roughhouse or sometimes when you dive or jump in and you don't want to get that warm water in your sinuses because it's very rare. Only about 150 people have had this type of infection since 1962, but all but two of them have died because it can travel from your sinuses up to your brain. Okay. So that's something to think about when you're so take the swimming. Soul water to your nasal rinse party. Yeah, <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> right. Yeah, and also I did want to plug this book. Okay. Um, if, you, if you are into natural cures, this is um, Suzanne Bennett, Dr. Bennett, who was featured in the piece, wrote this wonderful book, The Seven Day Allergy Makeover, and it talks about all kinds of natural ways to cure and to treat your allergies, and not just seasonal allergies, but allergies to things like environmental allergies, like dust mites, and you know, um, things in your house, and then also food allergies as well. Okay, well, Lori knows how to party. If you wanna find <laughs> out more information, all you have to do is go to cbnnews.com. It is allergy season, spring is here, and so is the pollen, so be informed, and if you're a sufferer, realize that sometimes the best way to do it is to go to the doctor and go through the shots. Well, Terry, on this wonderful note, over to you. Just a few drinks. Shane didn't think there was anything wrong with that. So long as the bills were getting paid and he was getting his job done, Shane had no problem being a functioning alcoholic. By the time he realized he was drinking himself to death, he couldn't stop. Liliana and Shane Stewart had been dating a year when they married in 2014. Theirs was a long distance relationship. Shane, a divorced father of two teenagers, was an Alaska-based commercial pilot. Liliana was an independent single woman living in Dallas. We decided that the best idea was going to be for me to move to Anchorage. And I was happy to do it. I could tell you that I really felt that God was in on this totally. Before long, she started to notice a pattern. I remember it was very early in our marriage and I realized that his drinking was a lot more than a normal social drinker. I, I wasn't an uh, everyday drinker, I guess you'd say more of a binge drinker. I knew something in the back of my head that this was not right, but my, I guess, ego, pride, you know, said that, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. Shane's drinking began in high school. I had a lot of resentment toward my parents from childhood. That anger just kind of progressed too, and then the alcohol was somewhat of the way I managed it. At first, Liliana overlooked his drinking, as long as he controlled it at work, as it could cost him his pilot's license. However, over the next two years, it got worse. She remembers one time when she was eight months pregnant with their daughter, Shane got so drunk, he passed out. He was passed out on his lawn chair, and he was asleep for more than three hours. So my mind goes into like, worst case scenario. What if I go into labor and my husband can't drive me? to a hospital, so I really started realizing that there was something that wasn't right with his drinking. Even then, Shane continued to justify his habit. I was making it to work, um, all the bills were paid. I thought, you know, it was okay if I just came home and I'm in my own house and there's nothing wrong with, you know, having a few drinks. Everything's taken care of. With each passing year, Liliana's anger and resentment towards her husband grew. Then in 2017, after three years of marriage, the couple realized they barely knew each other. Pretty much like roommates, like we were kind of both had our separate little lives, even though we were residing in the same house. I felt very alone and isolated. He was physically present, but he wasn't really there for us. It was then Shane began to realize he might have a problem. I realized that I couldn't taper off like I, I used to. The alcohol had really taken control at that point. It crossed my mind that I could start over with my daughter and take her and take and remove her from the environment. 
Despite her disappointment and frustration, Liliana decided not to pursue a divorce. Instead, she started going back to church, something she hadn't done for years. I believed in God. I, I knew God. I knew Jesus was my savior, but I did not have a relationship with God. It really became a place, a hub for me to be able to have relationships, authentic connections with, with people that were real. I didn't have to pretend that I didn't have problems at home. As she revived her relationship with God, Liliana prayed daily for her husband, but little changed. In fact, Shane was now drinking every day. He called me one day and I was at work. He says, I'm leaving you. He's like, you and the kids are better off without me. I was, I was disappointed in myself. I guess I really felt that I was weak because I couldn't control it. I mean, it was something in my life that I truly couldn't control. So Shane packed up his truck and drove out to a remote part of Anchorage. He says as he drove, God began showing him where his choices and addiction could lead. I'd see the person that had pretty much lost everything. I mean, they were, you know, at, at a bus stop or, you know, in front of a storefront and, and they had obvious addiction issues and they were passed out, um, dirty, tattered clothes. And uh, you know, I felt very strongly that it wasn't too much distance between me driving in my car down the street and that person. And I just really felt the strong presence of God that says, you can't do this, you, you gotta go back. He did go back, but continued to drink. Liliana continued to pray. Finally, after six years of addiction and marriage, Shane had a breakthrough. One day I did definitely just came to the realization that I've become a slave to a cup of liquid. Liliana and I had talked a little bit and I, I definitely prayed over it and then Christ revealed to me the answer to this. The answer was enrolling in the Celebrate Recovery Program at Liliana's church, Faith Christian Community. Soon after, Shane also began attending church with Liliana and their daughter. Through prayer and the program, Shane says his desire for alcohol completely diminished. He also made a commitment to follow Christ as his Lord and Savior. It wasn't any one profound moment. I knew, you know, that the Lord was talking to me, that I had to do something about this. I was getting more involved with having a relationship with Christ. Um, reading scriptures a lot more. Shane has been sober ever since, and he's still a pilot, cherishing his time with their blended family. Liliana is now a campus pastor at their church. They're both grateful how, through prayer and faith, God delivered Shane from his addiction and gave them a marriage filled with love and respect. You have to have faith, definitely have faith, just keep at it because it may not happen right away. It may take time and it may not be easy. It will work though. My prayer was for God to take away the alcohol addiction of my husband. And he gave me a brand new man. And then I let God be God. I let him do the work. And when he does the work, this is more beautiful than what I could ever imagine. I love their honesty, don't you? It's amazing how, well, first of all, we're all so incredibly self-focused, but how we can live together in a house doing life day by day and have lost all relationship with each other. You know, the choices we make can have such profound impact because we live in this fantasy that somehow as long as we feel like we're in control, everything will be okay. And then... That changes a little bit each day, and pretty soon we're out of control. Pretty soon we're right where Shane was. My life is controlled by a glass of liquid. You were not created for that. Any more than you were created for addiction to anything. You know, Jesus said when we know the truth, that the truth would set us free and that he came so that we would have life and have it abundantly. When you are controlled by anything outside of his love and his forgiveness and his redemption of your life. You're a slave. And we kid ourselves. We kid ourselves because we don't want to change, and then we kid ourselves because we don't know how to change. But Jesus came to change us. You know, he didn't just come to save us so that we could squeak into heaven. 
He came to change us so we could have abundant life here. Wouldn't you like that? Maybe you're just in a scenario where you're trapped in your own house, unrelational with someone who you once committed to share life with. We get to change. We get to choose. That's the gift that God has given us. We're not plants. We're not animals. We're made in his image and likeness, and we get to choose. So the question really boils down to, what are you going to do with that? There's a freedom in that, and sometimes there's a fear in that too, because it means coming outside of ourselves and letting God be God, as Liliana said. You know, she didn't rail on, she didn't bug, she didn't harass and harangue. She just prayed and let God be God. And in the end, God set Shane free, and that set their marriage free. You can start that same process. You know, Shane talked about the fact that as he came to Christ, Christ began to speak things into his heart, into his mind. That's because he started relationship with God. That's all this is about. It's about having a relationship with your creator. So invite him into your mess. Invite him into your life. Invite him into your heart. And even though it's scary, let go. God's got so much better a plan than anything you can possibly imagine or conceive of. He loves you. He's not going to hurt you. He wants to heal you. If you need someone to pray with today, our lines are always open. Our number's toll-free. It's 1-800-700-7000. Call. Just say, you don't even have to give us your name. Just call and say, would you pray with me today? I have, a, I have a problem. I have an addiction. I have a relationship problem. Your addiction can be to many things. If your marriage is struggling, when you call, ask for the Love and Marriage brochure. We're happy to send it to you free of charge. By the way, there's no charge for any of this. It's all free because we care about you. Call now. Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN News Break. Florida Supreme Court issued two major rulings on abortion Monday. The justices ruled that a 15-week limit on abortion is constitutional. That decision allows a stricter law with a six-week limit to go into effect. It includes exceptions for rape, incest, fetal, fetal anomalies, and medical emergencies. In a separate case, the court gave the green light for a referendum protecting abortion access to go on the ballot in November. Rainy weather in the nation's capital did not stop an Easter tradition from reaching record numbers. 40,000 people flocked to the White House Monday for the 144th annual Easter egg roll. The South Lawn and Ellipse transformed into a school community full of educational activities and, of course, the time-honored tradition of rolling hard-boiled eggs across the South Lawn with wooden spoon. The president said Easter is a reminder of the power of hope, renewal, sacrifice, and resurrection. The American Egg Board estimated a total of 64,000 eggs were used on the White House lawn. Thirty-three years old and losing her sight, this mother had a cataract in her left eye. She was tripping over things, bumping into people. Soon it got so bad she had to quit her job, and she could never leave the house alone. Olga Lopez noticed that she wasn't seeing clearly through one of her eyes. Then someone at the shop where she worked asked her a question. She looked at me strangely and asked if I knew there was something in my eye. She said it was a white spot. I went and looked and saw it for myself. At age 33, Olga had developed a cataract in her left eye. A few months later, the cataract got worse. It affected Olga at work. There were a lot of people who came into the store. I bumped into them because I didn't see them, and the light bothered me. One day, she was walking down the street and didn't see a metal pipe sticking out from a pickup. She came within inches of injuring her face and eye. Olga's husband got so nervous about his wife's safety that he asked her to stop working and not go out alone. She started crying. I consoled her and told her I was going to cover all the expenses. Now, with only one income, paying for eye surgery was not possible. I wanted to have the surgery so I could keep helping my family financially. 
Eric's salary was not enough. A week later, Olga received a call from Operation Blessing. A staff member told her that her case had been referred to us by the eye clinic. At first, we couldn't believe it. Now we have hope. Operation Blessing paid for Olga to receive free eye surgery. A surgeon replaced the cataract with a new inner ocular lens. When they removed the patch, I told her to cover her eye to know if she really can see me. And she said, yes, she could see me. In a short time, she was able to return to work. The people who paid for this operation are a blessing to us. I am so happy and grateful. Thank you. Now, thank you goes to you if you're a member of the 700 Club. If you're not a member, I invite you to join with us. It's real simple. You pick up the phone, you call us and say, I want to join the 700 Club. Number's on your screen, 1-800-700-7000. How much is it to join? Well, it's $20 a month, 65 cents a day. Some of you can join at higher levels. We have them, 700 Club Gold at $40 a month, 1,000 Club. $1,000 a year, and that breaks out to $84 a month. At whatever level, when you call and join, I want you to have this. It's how to believe for healing. We, we have healing segments practically every day on the show. We pray for people to be healed. This will give you the scriptural foundation of how to believe for it. What does the Bible say about healing? Is healing for everyone? Is it part of what Jesus accomplished on the cross? How do you have faith to believe? It's yours when you join, so call us, 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, we've got some wonderful comments here because you're going to send them that How to Believe for Healing. And this is someone, Cheryl from Auburn, Washington, who says, My husband and I love this DVD. We're believing for his healing from a stroke and we'll use this helpful guidance to continue until he's healed. And then another viewer says, We're studying How to Believe for Healing in our Bible study with our assisted living group. So lots of people using that resource, Gordon. Amen. Ethan Conley was attacked by a rare virus overnight. Within 48 hours, it started melting his muscles. What exactly does that mean? Well, according to Ethan's doctor, you don't want to know. He was a very rambunctious young boy, um, fearless, could not sit still. He was always bouncing a ball, climbing a tree. He had the best smile. He could light up a room. The evening of January 8th, 2010, Rebecca and Javen Conley came home from a basketball game with their children, unaware that their lives were about to change drastically. We got home and uh, put the kids to bed, and probably about 1.30 in the morning, Ethan began throwing up. And then Saturday morning, he had a low-grade fever. At that point, we didn't really think it was anything other than just a low-grade flu-type symptoms and figured he would be fine. But Ethan was not fine. In fact, he had contracted viral myositis with rhabdomyolysis, a rare and potentially fatal virus that mimics the flu and attacks muscle tissue. We needed to take him to the emergency room. He was on the morphine drip, um, and they could only give it to him every two hours. I didn't sleep at all that night, and I would just shake his, I'd grab his heels, and I would just kind of just move him just like this. And that would soothe him enough to get him through to that next hour. And it was at that point where they had diagnosed him with uh, the viral myositis. Over the next two days, his condition worsened quickly. CPK level is a level which is measured uh, when you have uh, you know, mu muscle breakdown. Uh, and when the breakdown occurs, the level starts going up high. Normally, it's less than 200. And he started with like 16,000 and then started going up to, to around 700,000. I said, what does this mean? <clears throat> and he says, you don't want to know. When the doctor said that, I just remember thinking, I can't lose him. Just, I just couldn't even picture my life without him. Once it attacks the muscles, um, it's just, there is no end to it. Uh, when you start looking into the virus in the, in the muscles, they're gone. The muscles were melting away. The Conleys began contacting friends and family on Facebook at their home church and all across the country, asking people to pray for Ethan to be spared. Our prayers went into a, a different mode at that point. We began reaching out to our church family, telling everybody to pray. We don't know what's going on, but it appears 
that uh, Ethan's fighting for his life. We got the news and we decided, okay, all right, this is what we have. Now our God is bigger than this. So we need to just draw on that. So that's what we did. The staff also warned that if he did survive, there would likely be long-term side effects. Usually you will have kidney dysfunction, um, some residual kidney problems, muscle problem, gait problem, uh, heart problem. Ethan was just laying there and he started looking at something and following it out the room. And he said, no, don't leave, don't leave. And I said, Ethan, everything's okay. We're, we're right here, mom and dad's right here. And he said, no, I don't want you to leave me. And so at that point, I felt like he was watching an angel and it was leaving the room and he was afraid that it was leaving him, it wasn't covering him anymore. Fear gripped me. I, I thought maybe it was death that had come for him. Javen and Rebecca knew Ethan's life was in God's hands. They couldn't find a pulse on him and it was getting really, really dim. I just wanted to look at Ethan and look at every part of him, try to remember and capture everything about him in case I lost him. I went into the meditation room and poured out my heart to God and said, God, if you take Ethan, I will serve you. And if you leave him here with us, I will serve you no matter what. You're a good God. I had a friend from our church that came, Jason Elliott is his name, and he said, and that angel that Ethan saw is here to minister to him, not to take him. And he, Jason didn't know anything about the situation. I felt a peace about it. I felt like um, God was just letting us know that he was there with us and taking care of things. Within 48 hours of, uh, of uh, the breakdown, he started recovering. It just was amazing. The Conleys knew they had witnessed a miracle. At my time in the ICU, I don't remember a whole lot, but I do remember seeing two angels, and I could tell that everything was going to be all right from that point on. Not only did Ethan recover, there was no permanent damage to any of his organs. He recently accepted a basketball scholarship to Ashland University. It's amazing for people that I didn't even know that were praying for me, and they just kept believing that. God would perform a miracle, and they definitely played a part in this miracle. We felt that the staff and the doctors and Dayton Children's was, were godsends to us. When they were binding together with us and praying with us, that just made our, our faith rise that much higher. We've had opportunities to share our testimony, share the goodness of God. Things in this life aren't always going to go right, and we're certainly sensitive and aware of situations that don't end up in a happy place like Ethan is currently. But the most important thing is to focus on that peace that God can give. We're going to have trials, we're gonna have tribulations. The only way to get through those situations is, is to have a foundation in Christ that can get you through. There are those times in life when faith is what you have left to hang on to, and it's more than enough. Jesus is who he said he was. He is who we need him to be. He's in our tomorrow already. Many of you are praying for things that you've not yet seen come to fruition. We want to pray with you today. We want to ask God to do miraculous things in your life. This is Dawn. She wrote into our email inbox. She said, I was watching the show while working on the couch. I was going through some strange breakouts of bumps on my body, including my right cheek. Gordon and Ashley were praying together, and one of the hosts said, there's a woman who has eczema on the right cheek, and it's being healed. I knew immediately it was me. I thanked the Lord, and the next day, the bumps were gone. Well, here's Marley. She wrote in to the email. Last month on the 700 Club during prayer time, Terry mentioned God was healing itchy scalp. Mm -hmm. I've been dealing with persistent itchy scalp for years. My dermatologist did not know what the issue was. There was no sign of psoriasis or dry or flaky, flaky scalp. It was always appears normal. Well, my scalp no longer itches. Praise and God. praise God. If you've been doing that for years, then when you get relief, you go, hallelujah. Let his word bring you hope. 
That's what the yeah. psalmist said, David said in Psalm 119, 119. Your word has caused me to hope. Mm -hmm. Now, here's part of his word. He has put his angels charge over you. You just saw a story of two angels in an ICU, and when they left, the disease left with them. You have angels charge over you, and it's plural in the word. It's plural, so that means you've got a couple. Isn't that wonderful? You can have a whole host of heaven come and, and come to your aid. Jesus talked about legions of angels, that there would be hundreds of them if he just would call them down. You know, that, that is reality. That's not some myth or some figment of somebody's imagination. When you get access and the eyes of your understanding are open, then, well, then you can see. And when you do, when the eyes of your understanding are opened, you know the greatness of his power towards us who believe. It's no longer a question for you. Your faith is grounded in present reality. You can have that too. His word has caused you to hope. Hope is the basis for faith. Realize it works through his love. His love is poured out over you. You have everything you need to be healed. So let's pray and let's believe and God will do all the rest. Lord God Almighty, we come to you. We come to you believing. We see your works, we see the signs, we see the wonders. Now open the eyes of our understanding, open our ears that we may hear your word, open our eyes that we may know, give us a heart of understanding, we would know the greatness of your power. And then come, Lord God, stretch forth your hand and do signs, wonders, and miracles for we ask it in Jesus' name. Terry, God's given you something. Now, there's someone, you have a problem with varicose veins, and the thing is, you're quite young. Um, it's not a matter of them being unsightly. It's the, the dull aching that's in your legs all the time. God is totally revamping your whole vascular system and relieving you from all of that. Just receive that now in Jesus' name. And someone else, you have a tear in your rotator cuff on your right side. You can hardly lift your arm. You don't want surgery. God's healing that for you right now. Just lift up your hands and thank you. Uh, there's someone you have a persistent amoebic in infection of your digestive system, and it's just your, your life has just turned into a nightmare. God is healing you stem to stern. He's cleansing you from all that infection, and everything is going to be normal with your digestion from this moment forward. Be healed and be restored. Someone else, you've got persistent um, uh, problems with your stomach, and the, it's ulcerated. Um, there's uh, underlying bacterial infection causing that. All of that is being cleansed out from you right now and your stomach lining is returning to normal, be healed now. May all that pain, all that irritation, all the bleeding, all of the problem leave now in Jesus' name. If someone else, you have an issue on the, the lining of your eyelids. It's, there's like an infection in the tissue there. God's healing that for you. All that itching and burning is going away in Jesus' name. Someone else, you've got a growth on your right ear, and God's going to shrink that and may it go away now. We receive it all in Jesus' name. Amen. If you've been healed, let us know. Let us share your good report with the world to let them know that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you need prayer, call us, 1-800-700-7000. Here's a word from James, and the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up.